Welcome to the 12th annual Norma Lytton Memorial Lecture for docent education. Dr. Bernard Lytton and his family endowed this lectureship in honor of Norma Lytton's memory and her work as a docent for over 30 years here at the center and as a research assistant in the paintings department. Her powers of observation were enhanced by her love of sketching, which often helped her see things where others did not. I'm Linda Friedlander, Senior Curator of Education at the Yale Center for British Art. I wish to thank Director Matthew McMahon and Diana Oko Inganadet of the Native American Cultural Center here at Yale for their collaborative efforts in welcoming our guest lecturer. And also, Courtney Martin, three months into her tenure as the newest director of the British Art Center, and also for her enthusiastic support of this program. I would also like to acknowledge the indigenous people and nations who have stewarded the lands and waterways of what is now the city of New Haven, in particular the people of the Quinnipiac Nation. <clears throat> Excuse me. We honor and respect this enduring and continuing relationship that exists between these peoples of the nations and this land. Edgar Heap of Birds is an artist and an advocate for indigenous communities. His work includes multidisciplinary forms of public art messages, large-scale drawings, acrylic paintings, prints, works in glass, and monumental porcelain enamel on steel outdoor sculpture. While representing indigenous communities, Edgar's art focuses first on social justice and on the personal freedom to live within the tribal circle as an expressive individual. Artist, activist, and educator, Edgar is a member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho nations, and these identities have informed his work for the last 30 years. A recent exhibition at MoMA PS1 presented works pointing to the legacies of state violence against Native communities while drawing parallels with events of the present day. The work monumentalizes the humble language of signage to expose and memorialize events and individuals that have often been forgotten, repressed, and deliberately erased. He works to open new critical perspectives on American history and culture. Edgar is Professor Emeritus at the University of Oklahoma. His work can be found in among other museums such as the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Walker Art Center, the Smithsonian Institution, and the British Museum. He has received numerous grants and awards such as from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Andy Warhol Foundation, and the Rockefeller Foundation. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Kansas before earning his master's from the Tyler School of Art and completed graduate level study at the College of Art in London. Edgar's talk tonight is titled Spiritual Spirit Citizen, Provocative Native American Public Art and Studio Practice. Edgar. Thank you for the welcome. Great to see everybody. Thanks for coming out this evening. Um, I wanted to make some acknowledgments uh, as I begin. Uh, we had read some of my Vita, but I wanted to uh, go into the probably more, more important Vita, I suppose you could say. Um, I've been instructed by four ceremonial priests in the Cheyenne Nation. I want to acknowledge those priests, those, those um, Instructors, mentors, Paul Peak Hart, was Rising Heart, Peak Hart, Roy Dean Bullcoming, Vernon Bullcoming, their brothers, um, and Jasper Wache. So those four men have instructed me over four years, so over 16 years of uh, ceremonial knowledge, and um, going forward for about 30 years within the earth renewal. And so I wanted to make mention of that and uh, that is an important credential uh, to help renew your nation, your tribal people. And I, I, uh, I congratulate those of you that are young that, that have uh, achieved those kinds of uh, bouts of learning. And I challenge everyone else to get it for, the, for you. If you don't have it, 
get that degree too. It's just, you'll, you'll need it, okay? Um, as we sit here in the British Museum, uh, the, the British Art Center, I wanted to also acknowledge um, colleagues. I, I attended the Royal College of Art in London and uh, around 1976. So I wanted to acknowledge Jean Fisher, really important writer, uh, book vampires uh, in the text, really important writer who was here in America, and she's, she's British, a colleague of mine who's passed on. Uh, Alan Miller, a great painter uh, in London, taught at the Royal College of Art. Uh, his director, Peter de Francia, who was a Le Corbusier scholar and a Leger scholar, and um, my director at the Royal College of Art as a student, as a graduate student. And most recently, Edward Fink. Edward Fink was a, a student there at Royal College with me, and uh, he went to Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. Um, and he passed this, this year, this year uh, 2019. So, so those are f four colleagues of mine uh, from, from London and from the time I spent in England. And I wanted to make mention of that as we are here at the British Arts Center. Uh, tonight's talk, uh, I always set forth as a honor to, to uh, support and honor the Native women, indigenous women. Uh, they've carried us so far and we have to always start with the women. We never go anywhere without them initiating the beginning of all that we have. Uh, pictured here is my grandmother, lightning woman, Howling Crane, and uh, many, many years ago with her daughter, Dorothy. So her name in Cheyenne is Hoetzio, which is a lightning strike in the earth. And I wanted to just make that mention as well. Uh, for our place in the, on the earth, we have to start with the horizon. We're talking about Oklahoma, where I was yesterday. And so this, this slide is looking west to the sunset from Oklahoma City out toward the reservation area. And so much of what I'll show you earlier in the lecture tonight will be from that horizon experience. So we have a lot of that in our life, um, very much uh, angular geometrical images. Uh, Hoetzio, a lightning woman, heap of birds, uh, she was married to the young boy on the end as he grew up. This is a guy heap of birds here. Uh, Grace Big Bear is the, the, fe the female leader of the tribe here, of the, of the family, and then black, black wolf heap of birds. In the center, uh, the father of guy heap of birds. And then if you, if you go further back, one more generation, you get Muya Hun Haskus, many magpies, uh, magpie birds, many of them together. And then at the Yale Art Center, there are some drawings from the incarceration from those Cheyenne warriors uh, when they were in prison in Florida. And so Black Wolf's father was one of those prisoners, prisoners of war. As I uh, worked in my career as a young artist, um, I was very fortunate to have mentors. And so you need to find that, of course, as, as young people, young scholars, artists. Black Bear Boson was very important to me in Wichita, Kansas. And so this is Black Bear Boson sculpture at the Little Arkansas River in Big Arkansas in Wichita, Kansas. And then this Black Bear painting. Uh, we lost Black Bear, I think at, at age 58. He died from an illness and operating in a hospital. Uh, he was an amazing artist and he was hitting his prime. Uh, I grew up knowing him and uh, we didn't have a lot of, he didn't have a lot of respect for what I was doing. I was a young kid, but uh, I, I really got a lot from him and I found uh, his support being there just as an artist working in the, in, the, in the public realm. This is a prairie fire, one of the most prominent native paintings ever made, and it's in the collection of the Philbrook Art Center in Tulsa. Uh, here you've got the, uh, the antelope, the wolves, and the native people, and the fire kind of in concert together. So there wasn't really a hierarchy that he was trying to describe. He felt them all to be believe, uh, beautiful spirits together. And his most uh, um, large, important creation was this um, mural uh, from Whence All Life. And you've got a couple of, well, three different segments of that. You've got the Godhead in the center, and you have the Southwest, uh, like Arizona, New Mexico, spirits here, the Yabaches here, uh, the mesas and the pollen being distributed. On this side, you've got the prairie and the buffalo 
uh, some of the scaffolding here and the buffalo skulls, more like the Kiowa Comanche and Cheyenne Arapaho, that he came from the Kiowa Comanche. And so when I met him, I was in a studio watching him paint this, and he told me he wanted to make four or five of these, you know, so uh, it, it's, it's regrettable that he didn't get a chance to do that. He would have done many, many great things. This is my first painting as a young artist uh, at the University of Kansas, probably 1973, 74. And here I am using that horizon as a uh, uh, visual way to communicate. I'm not thinking of the sun. I'm not thinking of the, of the prairie. It just happens to be how I see the world. And it's a six foot by six foot uh, acrylic on canvas. Uh, here's another piece. This is a serigraph. And um, I'm using those same kind of planes of abstraction um, moving together in this case, kind of intersecting. This is about a 12 inch serigraph screen print. Um, and I feel like it was coming out of that experience in the prairie, but later we get convoluted by uh, contemporary stylistic work, uh, such as Frank Stella, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, another mentor, a very important artist, was Don Secondine. He's a Lenin Lenape artist, and um, he helped me a great deal um, uh, as, as we were colleagues at, K at KU as painters. We had a painting class, a landscape painting class, but we made earthworks. We didn't paint on easels in the, in the prairie. And so his mother-in-law had died, a Kiowa lady, um, and so he made a piece about her loss. Um, and here is the cedar in the center. This is a tree we pulled, uh, just a big branch or a uh, uh, wood piece here. We painted the top of it. At the top was a horse hair, like women's hair. And so I show this because certainly I've become very, very involved with memorial, and I've done work all over the world about memorializing native spirits and the land. Uh, and Don brought me to this piece. We collaborated on it in 75, somewhere in there. And I didn't really understand Per, per se, what I was doing as far as how deep memorials can be, but it was a beginning, you know, with that work. Um, I went to college also in, in, in Oakland, California. I lived in Berkeley, California, and so I came back after a summer in Berkeley, um, and I was pretty happy and, uh, but very confused as an artist, you know, and I think that's something that continues, you know, travel so important for artists but it can become very, very confusing as well, though. So I came back, and I couldn't continue the, the uh, paintings. And one night, I was actually emptying some trash behind a laundromat, and I found a bunch of packing material uh, that was used for packing up refrigerators and so forth. And I came to my studio and got very, very excited about creating, again, sort of the angular forms, uh, but with found objects. And I continued that, that process. Uh, this is a, a very large, kind of about a 10 foot wide piece. Uh, this is rope coming, so it came off the wall about three feet. There's actually a dog house in here that I found on the street, carpet padding. And so very kind of um, um, uh, organic and very, very uh, direct process, visceral. Uh, they got more and more open in their orientation. And so I feel like I, I learned a lot as an artist about space and um, I guess more, uh, I guess you could say technical means of making art. Um, and I would keep that, of course, to this day. I make exhibitions in museums and I do outdoor work all the time. <coughs> um, but for me, going back to Oklahoma was very key. This is a tree, an old tree on top of Mount Scott where by, near where Black Bear Boson grew up in southern Oklahoma, which, uh, Wichita Mountains. And my son took this photograph uh, about maybe six years ago. Here's his photo work. He did a piece about his hair being cut and being uh, a blended person, hybridized, Cheyenne, Anglo. Um, I came back from uh, London, and, uh, and I went to Philadelphia. But I, I spent the summer after the Royal College of Art on the reservation, and so that was very key for me, and I would say, of course, it's like a cliche, but you go far from home, you learn about your home, you know, because you miss it so much. And so I really immersed myself back into the reservation. This is a Hoetzeot's 
moccasin. My grandmother, I mean, it's her design. And this is a serigraph I made at a, at a Cheyenne Art Festival on the reservation in the summertime uh, residency. Uh, and this is some of her beadwork here. I made these paintings in Philadelphia as part of my graduate MFA. But here you've got something that harkens back to that print with the intersecting planes. But I would say I was a big fan of Frank Stella. And, and um, I didn't really understand uh, a great deal about the geometry and the, the, the rhetoric behind these paintings. And they became more of a style. And actually, here at the Yale Art Gallery, I wrote an essay that's in a book. And there's Frank Stella's across the street, uh, the black paintings I like a lot. Uh, soon I will get deeper into it later. But uh, I found this to be representative of the style of contemporary abstraction that didn't have basis in life. You know, it was more like a base in style or rhetoric and so on. And so I wanted to take that abstraction that was what I found to be white man abstraction. And these are all mountains, of course, and rivers and stars. And, uh, but I wanted to have them fight my grandmother's moccasin. That was my theory. If I took the white man abstraction and my grandmother's moccasin, they could have a war. And then whoever won, I would go with them. You know? So it was a big, big decision there in Philadelphia. And there, there's the final abstract piece. It's, it's by itself. Uh, this is a blanket from the Cheyenne tribe. And again, the, the bottom part of the moccasin. And so I became more politicized from that battle. You know, I had to admit that I had both those parts in me, and they still are, but uh, I had to follow more, a more prescribed path. Another mentor uh, in Philadelphia, uh, one night we were so gifted to have Vito Acconci come to our class, come to our grad program. And this is Vito lurking in the dark here. There's Vito's face. And Vito is one of the most important artists I've, I've found to have worked in America. Um, and he, he really shook up everybody in my grad program. So he, was so, he was so sexual, sensual, political, personal. And uh, the grad students were fighting each other about whether it was really art or not. But I, 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 was, I thought he was a champion, uh, so I really liked that a lot. It would take about 1979, 78, maybe 82. I would be hanging up my words here on the wall in Brooklyn, and I would lean back and bump into somebody, and it would be Vito Acconci. So we're in the same show. Another great mentor is Stanley Whitney. And Stanley is a great painter. And he never really taught me at Tyler, but uh, we became friends. And he came to Oklahoma, uh, really wonderful painter, uh, one of his abstractions. And I think I still carry some of his flat space with me. In my, in my painting, you'll see my paintings a little bit later. Uh, when I was in Philadelphia, this is about an eight foot drawing, eight foot this way, maybe five foot this way. And so I was just kind of pushing everything into my work and trying to find, again, a, a, an answer or, or a, a more directed kind of journey. Um, so I left the paintings behind, the abstraction, the moccasin, and it just got me into the Philadelphia 76ers here, Dr. J playing ball. Uh, and I go to all the games. I got, it was five dollars. You can go see Dr. J play, Double D, Daryl Dawkins, and all these people. Um, and I would just put these things into my painting, into my drawing, and my life, you know, became part of the dis discussion. As I graduated from Tyler, um, it was fairly problematic in terms of the, my instruction. There wasn't really anybody there. Uh, they wouldn't let Stanley teach me, so there wasn't anybody there that was really. Uh, empathetic toward people of color or American politic uh, in terms of native people. Pretty, pretty bad, you know, pretty bad. Um, but um, as I finished my degree, I decided I, I couldn't have anyone come. It was not possible to have people come from Oklahoma to my graduate thesis exhibit. And so I decided to represent them with our names. And so Helen Crane is a uh, Lightning Woman's name, and then many magpies on that side here, is uh, Black Wolf's father, Moyuhan Hyaskus. And so I had my work in the gallery, I had paintings and some sculpture, but I had about six names that were die-cut red letters. And I kind of began this, this real strong uh, attempt and deployment of language in that thesis show. And so the words were there, and they embodied the people. 
Um, and I am, a, I do read a lot of research. I'm a scholar as well, and you have to be uh, to articulate native reality. Um, this is a painting I did uh, about, about 79. I think I graduated from Tyler. I had a studio downtown in Philadelphia. <clears throat> and I had found a, a letter written by a man named Captain Pratt, who kept the Cheyenne uh, POWs in Florida after the Ouachita massacre. And so I found his letter, and I made a list, an uh, eight-foot square list on a wall, all the red words of my relatives, Monomic, Eagle Head, Hippo Birds, top of the list, Bear Shield, Common Siva, uh, Little Chief, Haki Avi, that's my name. Uh, so all these names that are green are other Cheyenne members. So it says English words, Indian prisoners. And so I found that the, that the weapon, the tactic that we needed was language, to control the language and to defend yourself with the language. And so that's what I did with the work. And I researched, of course, the lives of the prisoners of war. And my grandfather was one. My uncle was one as well. Here are the POWs in Florida, in St. Augustine, Florida. And um, one of them they murdered on the way, on the train, um, graybeard. Um, and then some died when they were in prison. And other tribes were there, of course, Kiowa, Comanches, Apaches. Many, many tribes were brought from the West. And they were held hostage uh, in the prison and their families remained back on the reservation. And they built forts all around the reservation to, to control the tribes, to make Oklahoma into a state and make America a uh, state, you know, stateshood around, around the place. But these men were not tried. They were not really charged. They didn't even have identities hardly at all. And so that, that's very similar to what we still do. This is Camp X-Ray at Guantanamo Bay. And so these men have no identity, have no track, have no judgment, have no currency within this incarceration. So we're still doing that to, to uh, other, other societies. Uh, when uh, the warriors were there in prison, uh, one of the warriors, names was, his name was Bear's Heart, and he made a wonderful drawing, very defiant drawing, of the soldiers, horses, and the guns coming forward in a linear form across a prairie. And very, very bold to make that drawing while he was in prison as well. Um, I had that ex exhibition in Philadelphia with the, with the list of the Indian prisoners of war, and I had other work, and I had trouble with the museum. It was an ethnic museum, and so they weren't really open to me expressing a broad range of native thought without it being decorative. Uh, but I did show my work, but they, they instructed me that I had to make didactic wall text for each piece. And so someone could kind of digest it. And I don't think it's so, it's so productive to have wall text that's very, very uh, long and, and drawn out because then people stop at what you say. They don't think imagine their own way. Uh, and, and it bothered me. Um, so I was asked to go to New York from Philly and take part in the first exhibition of Just Above Midtown and Frank, on Franklin Street. Um, and that art space will soon have a, its own show at MoMA and I'm working with MoMA on that. Um, and so I made this piece for a, a wall in the back of the museum, and it was the size of a window. This is a window kind of space in my studio in Oklahoma right now. And so uh, it's something I continue to, to wonder about and to work with, and that is if you really have those expectations of always learning what Native people are, and that's what Native people are, are, are the duty for society is to, is to be informants. Well, then you have to be careful because it's not always what it appears to be. So on this side are all the shine words. On this side are English words, uh, fun, weakness, mystery. But, uh, but it's not really a glossary. All these are animals. So, so I'm really lying to everybody, you know, making a big joke. And everyone thought they were, they were learning Cheyenne in New York City. They, they tried to, oh, come, woo-ha, you know. <laughs> but these are all animals. They're not these things. You know, so, so sometimes if people are informants, maybe they, they might be lying to you, too. <clears throat> so back to Oklahoma, uh, the red earth of Oklahoma. And that's where I was yesterday, as I said. I moved back to the reservation in 82, and I've been in Oklahoma ever since. 
Uh, but as I, as I wanted to say that, you know, I'm not staying there. I'm in New Haven tonight. Um, in 82, I was asked to work with the Public Art Fund of New York City and uh, join in with David Hammonds, Hans Hacke, Barbara Kruger, uh, Jenny Holzer, Keith Herring, Billy Sullivan, Jane Dixon, um, really the leading artists of our time uh, from the 80s. And we were, we were given the privilege to articulate our ideas on the com computer billboard, the only billboard in Times Square in 82. There were no other billboards. So this was high technology in 82 here. And so I made a message about the white man. And in Cheyenne, Tatista is Tatista's uh, Cheyenne said Viho spider. And so Viho is white man in Cheyenne. And later they were called, uh, the same word was spider first, and then Viho was called uh, spider later. So what the, what the white man did much mimicked the spider, uh, the trapping, the catching, you know, those fences and so on. So I made this in Times Square in 82. I uh, made a project also with a group material, a very important collaborative group uh, in Brooklyn. Excuse me, and uh, this is a major space, a military terminal in Brooklyn. And here's the piece about the Washington Massacre, Colonel Custer, and I still work with that theme. Uh, and I put those words on the wall with group material. And then Vito was in the show. Vito Conchi was also. It was called Preparing for War. Um, in 80, 88, I was asked to return again to work with the Public Art Fund in New York City. And I wanted to um, act on another uh, mentor, Owen East, who is a Wapanoag man near the Boston area. And he taught me the, how to be gracious in what we offer today with Linda speaking and acknowledging the other nations that, that are hosting us today on this territory. And so Onis did this back in, back in 80 something, you know, I was, I was in the room when he did it. Uh, and so I decided when I go to New York, I shouldn't make art about myself. I should allow the tribes of New York to be acknowledged. And so this is 1988 and I made 12 panels about native nations and I placed the text reversed. So I'm indicating that New York must look backward in a different way about its history beyond itself. I've continued that series. Uh, there's many, many across America and Canada. Uh, this is my students I work with at the University of Utah. And often I ask the communities, what is the real name of your nation? And so um, uh, in Utah, there's not really a Ute anything. It's a mistaken word, as they told me. And the real word is Nucci, Nucci. So we, we, we were instructed by the students to make it say Nucci. Uh, a new project I just finished a few months back is at Crystal Bridges in, in Bentonville, Arkansas. And so there, I think there are seven panels acknowledging tribes uh, there in Arkansas at the museum. And it goes back in the forest. It's very nice, uh, the, the woods. And uh, this is Cheyenne word, which actually goes back into it welcoming all the tribes to be acknowledged that have come uh, to be there on that territory. And when my favorite is back in St. Croix, I'm in the Caribbean often, and so Taino or Forgotten in the Caribbean. And people come here for, fa for a fantasy life of the cruise ship, and they don't think about the, the lives that were lost, the Taino people. So I have a, I have a group of artists in St. Croix that have about seven of my panels, and they just like pop them up wherever they want to put them. So I let them have them. So it'd be so-called Columbus Day, and I'll appear on the beach, you know, and then they'll take them back down again. Great. Uh, when, I, when I was there, <clears throat> I was welcome to speak at the state legislature and join in with African Liberation Day. When I was there, uh, the University of uh, Virgin Islands, St. Thomas. And so I spoke uh, with their group of the representatives and professors and community members. So a lot of my work um, deals with uh, alliances with indigenous populations. So this was in uh, St. Thomas. And uh, Pitzer College, this is a pretty contemporary piece. This is a, there are 20, 20 panels that were up at Pitzer College and there are four that were collected by the museum on campus. And so this is uh, uh, Gloria Bagani a Tongva elder, 
And often I work with elders that instruct me on how to represent their tribal nations, and so California is backwards. Uh, the Anchorage Museum has acquired, uh, I think, 12 panels. I was in Anchorage a couple of years ago, and uh, they acquired these pieces, so they're permanent in their collection. And we had them outside just as the autumn was coming, uh, about August, the leaves were already falling. And the most important part of that experience was to go to the glacier and to, to uh, witness that, that ancient ice. And we brought that ice on board of the ship. And um, for me, it was a very, very important moment when I got to bless myself with that ancient water that came from many, many years ago. And that ice was there in front of me. I've worked a lot in Africa, in South Africa, Zimbabwe. And I, I have a, a lot of sort of sorrow in the sense of what's been going on with the racism uh, in Native America. And there are, there's racism uh, against other people, um, not only white people, but there's, there's, a, there's a Native American, African American racism. You know, and there's, a, there's kind of a competition of who's got the lowest rung on the ladder. Uh, and so so-called black Indians have a lot of trouble uh, in, in America, and Narragansett, Wapanoag, Pequot, uh, and I wanted to challenge that. So I went to Africa, and I worked with artists from the townships in Cape Town, also in Zimbabwe. And there are two eagles here, uh, a great Zimbabwe eagle from uh, Zimbabwe, and then my Cheyenne eagle from one of our shields. And so I worked with an artist uh, from the Narragansett nation. In the center of the picture, uh, uh, Tall Oak Whedon, Everett Tall Oak Whedon, and he's a Narragansett, uh, African-American uh, hybrid individual, lives on the reservation, Narragansett. And then on the right is the Ngozi Goniwe from Cape Town. And then we have a fourth artist, uh, Cynthia Ross Meeks, who is Wapanoag, black Indian. And so we worked together, we called it Eagles Speak, and so we talked about how if the Eagles met each other, they could actually they could com communicate and be friends the African eagle and the Oklahoma eagle. And I found eagles uh, in Botswana, you know, so I had this realization of how these forces could be together. And so we made a big exhibit at the uh, Rizzi Art Museum, you know, so, so much of my work is sponsored by museums and I've found a way to communicate for many, many citizens with the museum itself as a venue. Uh, this is at the Jacobson House, the Kiowa Five, you might have heard about, they lived here. Uh, in the early part of this, this century, uh, there were students at, at OU, and I made panels ab about the Sooners uh, here on campus and put those up as well. A big part of my experience, of course, is the land in Oklahoma, and I lived on the reservation for over 10 years, raised my children there, my two boys. Um, and the trees are so instrumental for me, the Jennifer trees, that are on the prairie, and they were brought in. They're not native trees, but I hiked every day with my dogs and, and lived in the, in the shadow of all these uh, spirits, these trees. That led me to these paintings, uh, the Nuf series, and um, this is a barn I painted in. Uh, so the shapes of the trees are kind of reflective uh, in this abstract fashion. So I had to find my own reference for abstraction. I couldn't go along with whatever was popular in Soho. I had to find my own reference. And it took many, many years, but I, I, I did locate it and I do continue it uh, from 82 to the present day. This is probably 2012, uh, the Nuf series. And they were started out with just a, with a blank canvas. And I began with one shape upon another shape upon another shape. It's like a storm brewing in, in, the, in the sky. Um, and usually in the, at the end, there's nothing there from the beginning. So it's really a very organic method of painting. And I, I enjoy the blues from the tropical vision I, I can generate from being in the, in the, around the equator. This is the mountain, the volcano in Bali. So I've, I work a lot in Indonesia and um, been in the water, the water world of Indonesia, and also the Gulf of Thailand and Samoa and elsewhere uh, in that part of the world. I also met with weavers in Sumatra recently. I was living in, on Lake Toba, which is a volcanic lake in the middle of uh, northern Sumatra. 
and really wonderful elder here that created these beautiful textiles. And the one I'm wearing um, there in Lake Toba. So that whole water world is, is so important to me. Uh, here is the reef and the coral and then the fish. So the, the element of buoyancy is, 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 for me, is present in my painting and uh, the color and the, and the coral from seeing so much under the ocean. And there's another one of the Nuf paintings. Uh, in December, I'm usually in Honolulu, and I work with Charlie Cohan, who's a, a master printer, professor of printmaking at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. And I'm back there this December to make a new suite of monoprints. Um, and then I spent another week uh, painting on the North Shore, and this is my little studio in the Lanai. And I'm making these small wood panels now, wood panel paintings, with a NUF series continuing and near the ocean. Uh, right now I have an exhibit at the St. Louis Museum of Art. I have a couple of pieces there, a specific piece um, that you can see online. And then, then this painting, which they have collected in the museum back in like a 96, I think, 95. Uh, and uh, it's in the Contemporary Art Gallery right now at, the, at SLAM. And I'm very proud to be showing next to Bryce Martin. And uh, I was very nervous about that experience. You know, I was very nervous. To, they said, go upstairs, your penny's next to Bryce Martin. I, I don't want to go up there and look at that. I don't want to see that because, I'm, I'm, you know, that's a very, that's a very significant challenge <laughs> to hang next to, or, or, or to uh, Joan Mitchell, you know, so. But uh, I'm, I'm pleased to report that it did okay. You know, the penny did all right. You know, I'm very happy to say that. So. So that's where the painting is right now if you go to St. Louis. Uh, in Australia, I've worked extensively in Australia. Um, I had a residency uh, in Sydney and Adelaide, Australia. And uh, right near the Opera House is the Contemporary Art Museum right here, Circular Quay. And this bay is where Captain Cook landed. So it's a very, very hot button place if you're an Aboriginal uh, native person. So it's more, this is the most kind of the critical moment of, of the world if you're Aboriginal from Australia. So I worked there with uh, Fiona Foley, who was an a, uh, a, uh, artist from Fraser Island. And together, we did it back in the 90s where there were no computer, we had fax machines. And so we made these two messages together. That's Fiona's on this side. That's mine. And so the, the doors open up like the, here at the, at the gallery, you walk in, the doors open, you open the doors, and you'd see this as you enter the museum. Uh, it's called Learn, Learn a War Cry. And so it's in the Eora language on her side, tribal language. And the translation is milk, honey, oh, you hurt me, set on fire, itchy, a war cry, blood, brave, black. On, my, on the other side, the right side is my work in Cheyenne, and uh, that text, on this side here uh, is um, Brits, ships, steal, hurt, learn, share, commonwealth. And we shared a lot together, of course, the Aboriginal people and the Cheyenne people. And the indigenous populations have a lot of the same kinds of mindsets and values about the earth and the, the stars above and renewal, solstice, equinox. And I want to talk a little bit about my piece in Denver. The Denver Art Museum. This is a, a, uh, a schematic of the origins of my piece. This is the medicine wheel at the Bighorn Mountains outside of Sheridan, Wyoming. And you've got, uh, this is the stone circle, about 50 foot across. You've got regal, cirrus, you've got solstice, sunrise, sunset. So all these are schematics of scientific observation. And it goes back maybe a couple thousand years. Uh, the Cheyenne, Shoshone, Dakota, uh, Arapaho, all these tribes share that, that medicine wheel. And so here you've got the wheel in stone, and then you can compare that to the contemporary Earth Renewal Lodge, which has the same vectors that these stones have. But these are, these are cottonwood tree uh, timbers. And the, there are fork poles that hold up the universe here. And so that's my locator for my sculpture called Wheel. And it's very, very complex sculpture, 50-foot circle, 10 different members, standing fork trees, 
porcelain and steel, uh, about a half million dollar budget, or, or plus another quarter, another quarter million dollars, but a uh, 10 year project. And right now we're, re we're replacing it. Uh, it's been moved to a bigger section of the museum grounds. And so I'm designing a bench right now to go around it with the text on it as well. And I showed my daughter, of course, uh, her name's Desba Huitzio. Heap of birds, Desba Lightning Woman, heap of birds. And we were in Denver together a couple years ago. She's 10 years old now, so I was showing her the sculpture itself. I was in Beijing, uh, Normal University, lecturing, and one of the students, a very brilliant design student, made me this poster, which I'm very, very proud of, and one of the best posters I've ever, ha I've ever had, and uh, it was done in China. So there again, sharing these ideas across the world. Um, this is the RESPECT program, which is part of the Shine Arapaho Nation, and I work with elders and also youth. And at the Yale Art Gallery right now, there's a photograph of a young girl on a Respect ba basketball team. I just saw it today. I was really, really happy to see that photograph. And so Respect is a program my tribe does for youth and also elders. Uh, <clears throat> and, and it's from gaming revenue. But here I work with, uh, where I'm working with 250 Shine Rappel elders, and we're articulating that medicine wheel right here. Those, the, the, uh, the access of, this, of the solstice, sunrise, sunset for summer and winter. And so, you know, certainly you can't always assume that elders know all the nomenclature of s ceremony. You know, that, that's, that's a misnomer. Uh, how would you know if no one taught you? And so <clears throat> when I went to the workshop, which I, which I, was, I created with 250 elders, I made it a point to undertake the design to be that access to, to, to understand and talk about what that medicine wheel means. And then everyone seems to know after that experience. My mother was there, my sister was there. It was one of the best days of my life to, to work with all those elders together. Um, the prisoners of war in Florida had a very tough experience, and as I said, some of them died. And when you're making these projects, whether they're workshops or sculptures, or interventions, um, I just wanted to say that you, know, you have to insist on it. Uh, that this work is so difficult and America's so resistant that you can't wait to be invited. You, know? <laughs> you wait forever. You know? So you have to insist, be insistent. And so here I am at Fort Marion, Florida with the two park rangers insisting we shut the fort down, insisting we make a fire, insisting we smoke that ceremonial pipe for the spirits that died there. And they went along. They said, yes, yes, you certainly can. You know, uh, they were a little nervous, but they said, yes, you can. And so we, we shut the fort down. The tourists couldn't come in. And we made that, made that offering there uh, for the spirits that died in that fort. Another and somewhat insistence was in, in Italy. I worked on the Venice Biennale with the National Museum of American Indian. And so we installed a series of panels uh, in the park that Napoleon created by San Marco Plaza. And then my son's there, Wugim. He was there with me. My wife was also there as well. Uh, and so this, this work was done to honor um, 16 or more uh, Dakota citizens that had died with Buffalo Bills Wild West shows. So they came, they came to Verona, Italy. They came to Venice. They came to Barcelona, Moscow, Paris, London. And they died all over Europe. And they're buried all over Europe. And so I took it upon myself to really look at the thought of who comes to Europe, and is it very healthy to do that? And uh, these warriors died from having, not being kept well, it, bad, bad kind of uh, housing and so on, and disease. Uh, the best part of that project was to make glass, uh, blown glass in Murano, Italy, and really wonderful. And I made these big <laughs> vases at, in concert with Simone, uh, who's a glass blowing, brilliant uh, maestro. And we made these, uh, these pieces, they're about one foot tall. And so we ended up creating the, the imagery uh, using the bodies of the warriors and children. There were three children and the rest warriors that had died under Buffalo Bill's care. And so we made the kind of blood forms uh, go around the pottery there. Uh, in England, uh, I've worked certainly back in England, and 
a major project called Wild New Territories. Uh, it was a, a eco art show that we was created out of Vancouver, and we went to uh, to England to deploy the work. The work, um, in a sense, was for me a, a rebuttal or or taking the racism and violence of all the lives lost in this hemisphere back to England because I, lay, I want to lay it at their doorstep because very much uh, they, they're off the hook in terms of the genocide. They think it's an American problem, but most of it in many ways was generated by all the European nations that came here to, to extract wealth from this, this hemisphere. And so I, I hired an anthropologist to chart me the genocide deaths, and we went from 25 million to 100 million lives lost in this hemisphere. And so I took that figure and I put it on this banner right by uh, King's Cross Station that goes on to uh, the European Union in Brussels, so St. Pancreas Station. Um, and the, so the European Union and the, the, the empire is still very well alive, uh, maybe uh, hurting other nations you know, around the globe. Uh, and at the bottom of this panel, there's also a, a, a biohazard image there and a dagger and a cross. Uh, the show uh, later went to Berlin and then later to Vancouver. And I have a series of these green panels that are mimicking money. And so I, I took a different kind of tactic with the sign panels uh, in Berlin and Vancouver. And we put all the money of the European uh, states, uh, you know, all these uh, different forms uh, from Germany, England, and elsewhere all around the panel. And these are meant to represent the lives of lost in the genocide. But it also looks like money because it's green, you know, so it's sort of a play on, on funds. I also worked certainly in Cleveland, Ohio, a very hot button place for racism with their uh, baseball team. And I made this panel uh, as a billboard. And I had a show with all Aboriginal artists from Australia that we toured there and I had a contract to create a billboard. And then I made this, this uh, design, and then the baseball team said I hurt their feelings. I said, I'm, I said, I'm, I'm too mean to their mascot. You know? and, and of course, that mascot is very, very hated <laughs> by Native people. Uh, and so we took it to the newspaper, you know, it was so inflammatory that we took the image to the newspaper and reported upon it. And the next day, they sent a reporter to my studio in Oklahoma, took a picture of this billboard, and put it on the front page of the sports page. You know? On the, on the sports page of, of, of the Cleveland paper. And then a few, few weeks later, uh, people sent in money to make more billboards. And then later, the, the museum said, can you please come and make ours? You know? And we made three instead of one. So I gave that billboard to the American Indian Movement, and they've carried it on from, for their own uses. So back to Oklahoma again. And so the earth of Oklahoma, the red earth, those juniper trees, and then we can go to uh, this piece uh, done from Northern Ireland to America. Uh, it's called American Policy. And it was in the Decade Show in, at the Harlem Studio Museum. Uh, and it's about 32 drawings. And so I've put it in half in two parts now. And the Whitney Museum acquired 15 drawings. And the second set uh, I showed at PS1, MoMA. And these are all just uh, expressions about the, the difficulty for Native life in America, the American policy against Native people. Uh, the major expression there is uterine hats, and that was from um, the Calvary, the yellow and blue Calvary here, and the green uterine image uh, text, uh, green being a, a fertile growth place. And the, the soldiers, or actually the militia, uh, uh, from Colorado cut open the uterus of the Shine women and wore the uterus on their hats as an ornament. And they were, they were determined to remove any kind of trace of home for Cheyenne people for the future. Uh, and they, they were later, you know, uh, condemned for doing that, but that was their sport. Um, and I made this piece, then went to Documenta, and uh, it was called In Honor of Native Americans, In Honor of Jews. And I didn't want to go to Germany and show the work, so I sent the work with, with group material, and we discussed how 
people are relocated and then they're destroyed. So to be relocated is the first step. Then next is your destruction. And certainly, certainly the, the parity between a Jewish um, life and native life. Um, just, just last year, I was asked by the editors of Art in America to create the, the uh, cover of Art in America magazine. And I worked with the editor, who was a great guy, uh, and um, uh, Will. And so I created a, a monoprint here. And then we uh, reverse America backwards to have America look their, in their past differently. And so every issue of Art in America was backwards that went out. you know. And, and, and so it's just something to think about if you're a young artist. You know, you can never really uh, underestimate what can be possible. And if someone told me, Edgar, you're going to reverse art in America on the cover of art in America, I would bet all my money against it. I, I'd give you all my money I got, you know. So, so, so things can change. Things do change. Power changes and ways change. This piece is really calling out all Native artists in this hemisphere to stop dancing for pay. You know, all of the decorative, all of the folkloric, all those things that have, have not served us well, to stop doing that and start to articulate the reality of the suffering and the violence that's going on, been going on, you know, and, and what we've done hasn't worked. You know, the, the decorative folkloric has not worked. So we must change. We can't dance for pay. My master printer in Santa Fe is Michael McCabe. And he brought me to the viscosity printing uh, methodology. And we work on a plate. And we work with uh, rag paper and ink. That's Michael there in Santa Fe. Uh, and then there's a plate right there. I'm painting backwards with clear liquid on clear glass. We're inking it up. And we make these monoprints. Uh, another master printer I work with is uh, John Greco in uh, LA, Santa Monica Boulevard. Uh, Josephine Press, that's me and John Greco. And then uh, Charlie uh, Cohan, who is in Honolulu. And I work with him, as I said, in the winter. So again, it takes you know, people to help you, experts, you know, brilliant uh, technicians and so forth to get this work done. You don't do it by yourself. So I wanted to acknowledge the printers that work, work together. Uh, this summer, I was very happy to be invited to be an artist at the uh, uh, Oscar Howe Summer Art Institute in, in uh, South Dakota, um, Vermilion, South Dakota. And I work with all these native students here, uh, and they made interventions. We put them out in a big 50-foot circle. I made four of my own, and we did a, a pretty quick job. I was there for about four days, and I engaged the group and. I had this had the technology ready to go with a print shop, and uh, Ms. Fast Dog. Is she here? Are you here? No, no. no she's here, but she's she, yeah. There she is. That's the artist up there, the brilliant artist that did this piece. And so um, she had a shirt that said "Yell Natives." I said, "What is that? Yell Natives? I didn't know you had there was Yell Natives." And so I was very very happy to hear there's Yell Natives. You know, so right on, Yell Natives. Um, uh, so I met her this summer, and then she made this piece. Here, uh, so really good artist. I, this young man, I'm, I'm trying to get him into grad school uh, in in uh, Baltimore as well. So it was really great to network with these artists, these young artists in South Dakota, and that's just this summer. I worked also last year with uh, students and faculty at the University in Michigan, Michigan State University, East Lansing, and that's a wintertime experience, but a similar project with all these text pieces that we made as yard signs uh, to, to intervene in a very kind of low budget kind of way. Um, and that's my, my little prototype for Michigan. It comes from a series of prints called Genocide and Democracy. My daughter, Desba, and I and my wife were in uh, Vancouver to open the show. It's a brother there doing his, his welcoming song. Here are some of the monoprints. These are 15 by 22. And they're all dealing, many of them, with, uh, with um, patriotic songs that I'm, I'm uh, recombining with my own text. And very important one here, very important here. And of course, it's notable to remark that the Statue of Liberty 
had his back toward all the Indian people. You know, so I made a piece in China that said, don't believe Miss Liberty. When they brought the Statue of Liberty out in Tiananmen Square, don't believe that lady because it's not right. She's not going to tell you the truth for Indian people. They welcome everyone else in this country. And for Native people here, there's no demographic for a strong voting bloc. So they claim you have democracy, but you can't ever vote your own candidate. You know, I mean, th this year was very different, but it's been very, very, uh, not much happening there in terms of demographic and voting rights in America for Native people. I did this, this piece, it was one of the monoprints, and I made a circle form. I was asked to join in with some young artists in LA, and many of them Asian American artists, and they had a, a show in Tokyo at the Metro, Metropolitan Museum of Art in Tokyo, and it's pretty cool. We, they took the work to Tokyo, and this is the center installation of all these circles, uh, and there's mine right there. I couldn't go to Tokyo, but I sent my piece. Uh, PS1, probably one of the breakthrough exhibits I've had, Active Shooter Custer, and uh, this piece uh, made in Santa Fe with Michael McCabe, uh, Surviving Active Shooter Custer, and these are 24 monoprints, and they're double size, so they're 24 by 30, 22 by 30 inches, all these messages, all printmaking pieces. And then on this side is the ghost of each print, has one ghost. And so I, I found uh, it important to continue to work in the ghosting so that today Native people are like ghosts of America. They're not really visible as solid citizens. They're forgotten totally. So I make a ghost for every print I make now, and I put them together. Uh, MoMA acquired this whole piece, so there's 48 at MoMA. And there's Michael and I. It's opened in Santa Fe, a site Santa Fe Biennale last summer. Uh, and there's more kind of uh, separate shots of each set of 24. Here are the ghosts of active shooter. And of course, looking at active shooters today, active shooter drills, um, and the Custer was our active shooter. Uh, one of my favorite uh, newer pieces here, this is a, a Health of the People is the Highest Law. And I, I dealt with the um, health crisis for Native people Today, a very, very acute, you know, very, very uh, destructive life with diabetes and so on, blood disorders. Um, and so all those are about personal experiences I have with, you know, family, family members and so on. An example is uh, at the Plaz, he was bonus veins. And uh, I don't know if many of you know about this, but that's when you can go back and give more blood than anybody else. They call you bon bonus veins because you get more money than anybody else can in a native context. So people go back and offer more blood. They get more of a big scar you know, from that. You might look at that scar if you see that. Someone that has a big scar means they give a lot of blood for, for money. Um, and this is uh, part of the show at PS1. Uh, this is called Blue Tree. And then at the end there, the pastels, American policy. Uh, there's Blue Tree. And these are from about maybe 10 years a time of my monoprints. And I work on different colors as well, and uh, under, underprinting as well with pink. And the intervention I did in Atlanta, the Trail of Tears intervention, we had that up on Peachtree Street in, in, in Atlanta, and we put that up at PS1. Some of the tribes from New York are in Oklahoma, and they've relocated to Oklahoma. And uh, a piece here about native songs, more, more, more kind of romantic and more humorous uh, about these 49 songs that, that are after party powwow songs. And I quoted a lot of the lyrics. So a lot of it's not really all about you know, troubling topics. Uh, this is a Fort Supply. Uh, is more critical political kind of discussion of Custer and the fort that they built for him to attack the Cheyenne at the Washtenaw Massacre. And, and the 7th Cavalry is still fighting. Here are places they've been lately. A little big horn is one, but Afghanistan, Vietnam, Iraq, the 7th Cavalry. And uh, again, one of my favorites here, uh, this is uh, an Indian home. And reflections on my grandmother, Hootsiaw, who I showed you at the end, at the beginning of the talk. and. Um, 
This is uh, about my life in Oklahoma on the reservation and memories and the ghost set of those prints. We hang them together in a corner. And I think this may be almost the, 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 the uh, most contemporary set of prints. Uh, it's called Standing Rock Awakens the World. And it's all about Standing Rock. And there's, there's 24 ghost prints that go with this. It has not been exhibited yet. Um, and I made that in Santa Fe. Uh, my favorite piece there is Water is Our First Medicine. And these are all monoprints, uh, 22 by 30 inches. Uh, my, my last uh, set of prints that I've created is uh, called Columbus Day, and we just celebrated that uh, recently. And so these are all about Columbus, his son, the so-called New World, the empire continuing to, uh, to uh, destroy indigenous people, plants, water, all those things. Uh, I was recently in the Dominican Republic, and I went to Columbus's son's palace, and all this was research I, I gathered and, and living there in the DR, and having been in St. Croix, St. Thomas, uh, and also been in Valencia, Spain, uh, Barcelona, and also Rome. You know, so I, I, I have made that circuit, and these are my, my reflections on that. There are 24 of these pieces, and there's, some of them are ghosts here as well. Another Columbus Day slavery uh, discussion, and the, brutal, and the brutalizing of Native people if you didn't find what they wanted you to find in terms of gold and so on, uh, those tribes. And the diseases that, that was, were brought and given to the tribes, agents of genocide. So all these are made on a plate, and then I'm, I'm painting them with a clear liquid, and then it's resisting the ink. Uh, then I have another uh, kind of uh, method which bloodies it up to where it looks like a poured blood. It's, it's a spray. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to also remark uh, our own history with the Caribbean. Uh, the Cheyenne have that history, and that is fighting the Buffalo Soldiers. The Buffalo Soldiers were brought out, uh, sort of pre custer to fight our, our warriors. And they were coming out of the Caribbean, out of the Middle Passage, out of slavery. And they wore buffalo coats, but their hair was also discussed as buffalo fur. And so the tribe had to fight those soldiers. And I visited uh, Columbus's son's bedroom, and I was, I was very shocked to see that he didn't have to leave the room to shit. He, he, he had a little armoire, and there was a big pot, you know, and they would just come and take it away, you know. So they were very gracious to him. They just take it away and bring him a fresh one, you know. So we're tired of emptying his pot. You know. And to crush the a Spanish crown. And natives survive in spite of the empire. We survive with, with the grace of the ceremonial life, with the sage, with the renewal of the earth, and with the family, as I showed you my grandmother and our, raising our kids, Hoetzeal uh, in the center, my wife, Shenna. Ketchum Heap of Birds, who's a, a uh, scholar of Native American performance, getting her PhD at Middlesex University. And I want to close the PowerPoint with that and play you a very, very short two minute video. I always talk about how painting doesn't ever stop. And the painters never quit painting, even when they're not painting. I mean, they're, they're going to go back and make that progression extend further. They should be exploring with the medium, you know, and reorganizing the configurations and the exploration and investigation. you got to articulate the ideas through a form, exploring new ways to articulate those shapes. The 
earth doesn't care about humans. The earth has nothing to do with humans. And it's fine on its own, and it's been fine on its own. And, and you can kind of damage a little bit of things, but only as it pertains to humans. Like if you mess up the ozone, we get more sunburn. If you poison the water, we can't swim in it or drink it. It's spun before, it's gonna spin after. But, but people relate more to each other. And they, think, and they think they're getting something done because they relate to each other. And then someday, the earth will move, tilt a bit, and get too close to the sun, and there'll be no more people here. And that's why the, the tribes are so have so much humility. We pay homage to where we are. That's what, that's what we do every day on this planet, is that we don't we're not bigger than it or more smarter than it. We just, we're happy to be kind of hosted by it. Well, we're on the, the allotment, uh, the North allotments, North uh, Arapaho family allotments, my mother's and her relatives. I moved here in the 80s, the early 80s, and I, my great grandmothers, they were very generous and allowed me to live uh, at the top of the hill, and it had me, didn't have any running water and no electricity, and it was a three-room kind of old house. But but living here was a was a real privilege, and learning from the land, the weather, the animals, and again that wasn't easy, but uh, I think it puts me in a good position to always be comfortable on the planet. You know, like I'm I'm comfortable wherever we are. But I made, I made a lot of the work, that actually the work that the Whitney collected was made out here, you know. And a lot of the work that I've got being shown in museums and so forth, uh, major museums in the world, was made out here. And it still resonates. You know, like every shape should be an, an entity when you're painting to me. Like every shape you make should be like a little animal spirit or it should have that weight it's not an embellishment. It's like this tree is something. And you know, you know that you look at a tree, you touch it or whatever. It's like, you gotta be like that tree's gotta be, have as much status as anything out here, you know. And then you overlay it, you know, overlay it, overlay it. And then you get this, like here, you get this strata of all this visual beauty. And, uh, but it comes from being in this environment for, you know, years and on a daily basis. It's become a language, a visual language for me, a visual language that can be repeated and I can explore anywhere, but, but it comes from the experience of being on the land as a young, young man and, and just continuing that, that relationship you know, in, in the work as well, as well as in physicality, but also in the, in the work, it's gonna, the homage to the, to the earth is gonna be present. as an artist, they need to be, live in a place that they can learn in. They need to be somewhere living on this earth that they pick, that they can learn, not the hippest place or the funnest place or the most money money place, or, but you want to learn where you're, where you're sitting and sleeping every night, where <laughs> you need to learn. So it trickles down into being something very significant if you understood where, you, where you're sleeping, where you're living, and be you know citizens of that place. and, and take care of the spirit of those places. <laughs> Red bird. All right, thank you. Thanks. So I guess we can have some time for a little feedback. And I also brought cards for everybody. If you want a printmaking card, there's cards here I can give away. So um, if there's any comments or questions? Yes. We have a mic. I don't know. 
What you explained about the sign with the um, giving, donating blood and the scar, this is not something that I could figure out by just reading that. And then you spoke earlier about uh, not having lengthy explanations. So what kind of relations? People, lengthy explanations oh. under your oh. works of art. So I'm just wondering, when you do your art, do you are you satisfied if people see it and don't understand and they miss the message? Well, yeah, I'm satisfied. I mean, not everybody understands, but many people understand. And and uh, and, and for me, the the text and the words are a beginning of the, of a discussion. You know, so. So the, the, I have a, my own solid kind of uh, desire about what to communicate, but I'm very involved also with respecting what the viewer can bring. And, and if you can make something else out of it, or you want to make something else out of it, then I don't tend to want to s describe that myself, but if you have something to bring to it, then that's also an outcome we want to have. It's like you bring something from you, I bring something from me, together it becomes something. You know. You have to give the viewer credit, I think, you know, I think. Well, thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you, thanks.